four. Reading from 2 Chronicles chapter 34 verses 1 to 4 and 8. Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. In the 18th year of his reign, while he was still young, he began, began to seek the gods of his father David. In his twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, Asherah poles, carved idols and cast images. Under the direction of, and altars of the Baals were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them and smashed the Asherah poles, the idols and the images. These he broke to pieces and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. In the eighteenth year of Josiah's reign, to purify the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, son of Az Azaliah, and Messiah, the, ru the ruler of the city, with Joah and Johas, the, the recorder, to repair the temple of the Lord his God. Brilliant. Thank you, Nisha. You did amazing with the names as well. Very difficult names there. Let's pray before we look at that together. Father, we know that you send your word out so that it will do something. Lord, that it won't return empty, but it will affect us, change us, help us to grow, correct us, rebuke us, train us to follow you, whatever we need. And we pray, Lord, you would send your word out today in the power of your spirit uh, to change us straight away, Lord, to make us different, to make us more like Jesus. And we just ask for this prayer week, Lord, you would teach us to pray, teach us to call on you, Lord. For your glory's sake we ask. Amen. <coughs> so we're going to take a quick look at uh, this chapter, but I, I really recommend you go home and read uh, chapter 34 and chapter 35 because they're an amazing uh, part of the Bible um, where Jesus works in an amazing way, okay? So we are going to listen to Jesus' word, but we're going to do something a bit different. As soon as we've listened, we're going to put it into practice this morning, okay? So it might make you a bit nervous. Uh, don't worry, it's nothing crazy or extreme. <laughs> But you might feel a bit nervous because it's not what we normally do. But how many times have we heard what Jesus says? Oh, I must do something about that. And then two years down the line, he speaks to us again. And we're like, oh man, do you remember I heard a sermon on that? And I said, I must do something about it. I must do something about it. And then five years down the line, it goes on, doesn't it? So the best thing to do is to say, Lord, I've heard you. Help me to put it into practice. So we're going to start prayer week today. Surprise. But a good surprise. So we're going to look at prayer this morning, but I, I'm not going to call it that really as I'm preaching. And the reason is, I think, when you hear the word prayer, even as kids, isn't it, growing up in church, You've already thought of something in particular, haven't you? Whether it's a long meeting where the adults just go on and on and on and use big words I can't understand, or a time to try and say complicated stuff, or a time when I feel really scared because I don't know the words that everyone else knows, or I've got to try and say things in the right order. I think we all get an idea of prayer or a prayer meeting, don't we? But it's not necessarily what Jesus says it is. There's one particular word in this chapter 
that we're going to look at that describes praying, but we're not going to call it that because we want to make sure we get it right. So we're coming on to that. But verse 1, Josiah was eight years old. Do we have anyone who's eight here today? One. Okay. Anyone who's around eight, nine, ten, six, seven? <laughs> A couple. He was eight when he became not one class higher in junior school, when he became king. Now, you've seen all the fuss in the news about who's going to be the next prime minister. No matter what you think of it, it's quite daunting, isn't it? He was really young. A whole country. Can you imagine that, Jacob? Imagine if you're in charge of everybody. Whoa, that's a big responsibility, isn't it? Massive responsibility. Can you imagine, Ezra, if you were... If mum woke you up one day and said, Ezra, you are in charge of the whole of Wales at eight. Imagine some of the stuff you would want to do. <laughs> In a ch- children's mind, isn't it? There'd be sweets everywhere. There'd be bouncy castles. There'd be whatever, wouldn't there? Awesome stuff. But the reality would soon kick in, was not it? When you'd have cues of poor people needy people, ill people, I'm ill, help me. I don't don't know what to do. So can you imagine what it was like for him at eight? It sounds awesome, and it was, but it was also a massive weight, wasn't it, to carry. I'm responsible for everyone in the country. So he was still really young. And it says... In verse 3, in the eighth year of his reign. So how old was he, mathematicians? 16. I can hear it being whispered. 16. So he's, and it, just in case uh, you didn't know, Jesus does comment on age while he was still young. So all these 16-year-olds who think you've made it as an adult, you're still young. Still young, according to Jesus, according to the Bible. But he was 16 when what? He began to seek the Lord. There's the word for prayer, seek. What does it mean? It means when mum has to drop you off at school tomorrow and she's lost her car keys, what does she do? She seeks for them, yeah? She looks for them. Does she look calmly when you've got five minutes to get to school? (laughs) <laughs> it's a massive panic, isn't it? Where's my shoes? I haven't worn them for three months. That's what's going to be happening, isn't it? They, we don't say, seek for them. <laughs> we say, look for them. But it means the same thing. Have a look. Look for them. They're there. And where often are they? In exactly the same place you left them. We have a little thing sometimes, isn't it? Where's my whatever? And I, I joke, I'm like, if I find it in your room after 30 seconds, you haven't looked hard enough, isn't it? It's often exactly where we say it is. But at 16, while he was still young, he began to seek the Lord. He began looking for Jesus. But not that Jesus is hard to find. Jesus isn't hiding on purpose. Our sin keeps us from him, hides us from him. But he began to seek the Lord. He began to talk to Jesus. He began to ask for his help. Jesus, how do I cope in school with these tutors who who seem to be trying to get me to do what they want to do? How do I cope, Jesus, as king with all these poor people queuing up at my door asking me to feed them? How do I cope? He he began to seek the Lord. That is a great thing, but did you notice that means there was an eight-year gap? 
Eight years when he wasn't asking Jesus for help. Eight years is a long time. Ask the gardeners in church this morning, if you left your garden for eight years, <laughs> what it would look like, you just wouldn't do it, would you? It would be overgrown with weeds to start with, wouldn't it? Brambles everywhere, so you tear yourself up every time you try to get something from the garden. There'd be, it'd be uncontrolled, and maybe some of the roots have started, plants have started to grow weeds that you don't want there. Maybe some of the roots have started to go down under the patio, and it started to crumble and lift up, and it's just a mess, isn't it? When you leave something alone like that, it, it just gets overgrown. Well, imagine eight years of not seeking Jesus. And we're told later on the idols that crept in were all over the place. Evil started to come into people's hearts and the church started to drift and they started to grow to love all sorts of other things other than Jesus. And sometimes we look at that, isn't it? I don't know, if you, if you left a garden for eight years, imagine if you didn't tidy your bedroom for eight years. When you come to look at it then, you're like, oh my goodness, where do I even start? And you pick up a book off the top of your floor drobe, and you're like, that's made absolutely no difference at all. Sometimes it can feel like that in life, isn't it? that all these other things start to creep into our hearts, these things we're looking for life, and it's almost like we seek them, isn't it? Rather than Jesus, we look to them for life. They crowd in our hearts. Our hearts get overgrown with all sorts of stuff. It's so confusing and intimidating in life, in school, in family, in work, in retirement, marriage, singleness, later years, whatever it might be. It just seems like it's all tangled up, it's all overgrown. There's things growing where they shouldn't be. There's stuff got in under the surface that's going to have to be pulled up. Where do I start? You start by seeking Jesus. That's where you start. That's what Josiah did when he felt overwhelmed. But there was that eight years gap. If you're not a Christian this morning... How many times has your life been in pieces? You felt frustrated, your plans have fallen apart, your life has crumbled away, you've lived for something and it's let you down and made you miserable. But you look at your life and you just say, I don't know where to start. Let me ask you this. How many years have gone by and you still haven't begun to seek Jesus. Eight. Sixteen. Twenty. Forty. Sixty. Eighty. I'm going to have to do this one because we've had people... A hundred? Isn't it long enough? However old you are, hasn't enough time passed? Because Jesus has been seeking you all of these years to save you, to give you a hope, to give you a future. How many years has it been? The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. And Psalm 9 says, those who know your name will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. 
You might say, what, what good is it doing asking Jesus? He has never pushed anyone away who's looked for him. It's an amazing thought, isn't it? Will he receive me? Will he forgive me? Yeah. He has never forsaken anyone who has sought for him, who's looked for him. But don't think it's just for people who are not Christians. This is needed for all of us, even those who've trusted in Jesus and been Christians for a long time. Later on in this chapter, when Josiah is 26, he inquires of Jesus again. In other words, what God is saying is we always need to begin seeking Jesus again. Every time something new happens in our life, we need to seek him, don't we? New class in school, people are not being nice, a new teacher moving away from home, a new job, a new health problem, we're dying, we're lonely, we're upset, we're broke, whatever it might be, we're guilty, we feel condemned, we're in darkness, we're frustrated, we're angry, we feel hopeless, we feel rubbish. As a Christian, when was the last time you sought the Lord? That's why we're not using the word prayer this morning as such. When was the last time you said, Jesus, I'm looking for your help in this, please help me? Because in Revelation, it describes our prayers like a big bowl of amazing perfume. And as the angel brings it in before God, all the perfume rises. Because of what Jesus has done for us, he takes our prayers and he brings them to God. And they're like a sweet smell in his nostrils and he, he takes it in. You're not just talking to thin air. Prayers are not just useless and rubbish. Seeking Jesus isn't fruitless. What does it say? It says, when God smells that, that the language is dramatic. On the earth, there's earthquakes and lightning and thunder and storms and stuff. In other words, you can be sat as the only Christian in your class with your teacher and you don't understand what's going on and everyone else doesn't get it and they're being horrible to you in the playground and everything like that. And you seek Jesus. You say, Jesus, I need your help. What does he say? It is earth changing. It, it, it changes everything. He has got, there's not power in us, but there is power in him. He has the power to change so much. And that's exactly what started to happen. But children, this week, we want to see you at prayer week. We really want to see you come to some of the meetings and pray. I mean, I'm going to ask the adults, and we're going to do it at the end this morning. I'm going to ask if we can just if there are children there, if we can just keep our prayers short. Yes, it's a discipline for us, but it will help them to seek Jesus because they'll understand what's happening. Just one sentence. How many of the prayers in the Bible are just one sentence, two sentences? And they get an earthquaking answer, don't they? And some of the best prayer meetings have been that, isn't it? Just one after the other. So we really want to see the children this week at prayer week, not just the Wednesday night, but any of the meters. I know some of them are in school in the mornings, but in the evenings, come along. Children, uh, parents, bring kids, or yeah, if you're Ethel, bring mum. <laughs> Drag her along, whatever, whatever needs to be done, yeah. And what happened? What happened? We're told after another four years, in the 12th year of his reign, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high, high places. So now when he's 20, it doesn't say he's still young now, so I suppose somewhere between 16 and 20, you're not young anymore, or not very young. But that's, there we are. So at 20, what happens? He starts to have a clear out. I remember coming back from university and looking at my bedroom and thinking, why have I still got that? Why have I still got that? I don't, hands up who's ever had a clear out of their bedroom thing, I don't need that anymore. It's too babyish for me. I don't need those teddies or, 
I know, shock horror if you're a bit younger. I don't need that. We do, don't we? When we grow up, we're like, I don't need that. Why, why have I got that? I've grown up. I've grown up. And what happened was, what changed, first of all, was Josiah's heart. As he started to seek Jesus and ask for his help, Jesus started to change him. And he started to see all the things that they'd lived for and trusted in couldn't do anything. So he said, you know what we need to do? We need to have a good clear out. I know Jenny loves a good clear out. We've been clearing out some of the old junk from the church. It just gathers, doesn't it? Because you don't do anything. We've been having a clear out from some of the rooms. It's, it's good, isn't it? You feel like you can't do anything in that room, and if it's a messy bedroom, until it's been cleared out, until it's been purged. Some parents are like, yeah, it needs a purge. It needs to be like cleansed with fire, doesn't it? To get rid of all the germs in some bedrooms that, that are out there. But that's, that's what it is. So he purges it. So he, because he's changed, because Jesus has changed him, he sees things differently and things around him then start to change. He gets rid of all the idols, all the things they've been trusting in that can't give life. He, all the prayers, all the incense they've been offering to all these different things. He just smashes it all breaks it to dust. He's like, what have we still got this for? We've got the real thing in Jesus. We don't need all this. And he has a massive clear out. Because Jesus has cleared out his heart, it starts to overflow into his life. And it just, he has a massive clear out. When you start to seek Jesus, just know that, that he might not change your situation straight away. But he will change you in that situation. And sometimes we don't like that, do we? It's like if we're in the wrong or we need slightly refining or changing. But that's what he does. But then things around us start to change. At 26, so in the 18th year of Josiah's reign, he began to purify the land. So he begins to rebuild. So once you've started to clear stuff out, and when, Jesus, when you seek Jesus, he'll start to put his finger, that, that's wrong, that attitude, that's got to go. That thing you love there, you, you can't trust in that anymore. You, you'll want to get rid of it. You'll be like, I don't need it. And then you can start to rebuild. That's the first thing I remember. Um, do you remember we had, I think it was 2015 or 16, we did a Christmas meal, Christmas Day here. And my dad did the cooking. And I made, he was a professional chef, so I made sure I cleaned our kitchen. Do you know the first thing he did when he came? He cleaned it again. And you think, thanks, Dad. But his point was, it's got to be ready for the purpose it's meant for, is it? He didn't know. But it was, it was shining. It was spotless. And before our lives can become what they're meant to be, they need to have a good clear out. Jesus needs to come. But look what happens then. If you read the rest of the chapter, he sends men to start to rebuild the temple and the, and the sacrifices then can start again. So the gospel preaching, the preaching of Jesus is blood on the cross that they can all be forgiven. Restarts. He rebuilds the temple, which has crumbled and faded and it's been forgotten. Jesus is sacrificed. And someone finds the Bible. That's stunning, isn't it? In church, someone finds the Bible and says, what's this? Oh, it's God's word. That is shocking, isn't it? But I think sometimes that can happen in our lives, isn't it? We can forget what God says. It's like we rediscover his word and it's powerful. And what happens, we're told at at 26, after all that has happened, they celebrate this incredible Passover. So everyone gets together after this clear out, after seeking Jesus, after seeing the preaching of his death through the sacrifices. They know they can be made clean. Their guilt can be taken away. And it says the Passover was not celebrated like this since Samuel. That's about 300 years ago. And none of the kings celebrated a Passover like this. So they rejoiced that Jesus had died, was coming to die to forgive them for their sins, and they had an amazing revival. So it went from the place full of all sorts of things to trust in and loads of people feeling numb and cold to everyone knowing Jesus' life and presence and help. Where did it start? When he was 16, he began to seek the Lord. 
That's it. He didn't have a clever strategy or an idea or... He just asked Jesus. And look what he did. And he kept seeking Jesus his whole life. And Jesus brought an amazing revival. The Bible is full of people who seek Jesus. Remember Matthew 9, 38, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers, to raise up and send out laborers. Seek him for people to serve and work in church. Hannah sought Jesus, didn't she? The church in Acts, when they got told not to preach anymore, they sought Jesus and the whole room was shaken. God showed up. That's what we really need, isn't it? We don't need a better Little Fishes group with a snazzier logo, isn't it? We don't need um, whatever it might be, the latest tech in youth clubs. It's nice. It's a tool. We need God to show up. And if God comes into those meetings, as people start to seek Jesus, who knows what is possible? So what I'd like us to do very quickly, and we put this into practice, is to get into small groups and seek Jesus. I know people are nervous about praying in front of others, but let me just say this. Isn't the answer you get, or you could get, more important than the way you look in front of others? We've seen some incredible answers lately in the church where Jesus has provided. That's what we're really interested in, isn't it? The answers. Jesus hearing and answering. So if we can do that just for five minutes, if you've got children in your group, maybe groups of five or six, no more, because I think then people start to get really nervous. Groups of five or six across the church, you're going to have to bunch together maybe in the balcony or come down, whatever you want to do. And if you've got kids in your group particularly, you're going to be limited to one or two sentences. Keep it short. Keep it simple. He already knows what you need before you ask. But let's seek Jesus together for a few minutes. Let's raise our hands. So thinking of what we've heard in this week, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy 
and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen.